So this whole wicked problems thing and conversation that Tony and I have started has really brought some really interesting conversations. So as Tony and I were talking about what we wanted to do next, because we have a long list of wicked problems that we want to talk about, um, this whole idea of electric vehicles versus what we're driving now, internal combustion engine. Yeah, I know there's hybrids and other things too, but let's just go with those two extremes. Really has fascinated both of us. And so Tony has sent me an article to kind of prime uh, my prime my thoughts. And the very last paragraph ta- caught my attention so much. And this is what it said. What is needed, however, is an honest and comprehensive evaluation of the entire life cycle of clean energy from raw materials through disposition. There are pros and cons to all forms of energy. To date, all we've heard are the benefits of clean energy. It is now time to highlight the true cost of clean energy, which must include the negative societal and environmental impact as well. And wow, you know, I'm kind of like, because I'm a clean energy advocate. I mean, Tony, you know that. But this is true for everything. Oh, my gosh. That's what struck me. Yes. The reality is we have a trade-off for everything we do. And if we don't look at both sides of that trade-off, then how do we know we're making the right decision? So true. And I've got even all kinds of stories I can think of in that. But today we're going to talk specifically about electric vehicles and vehicles as we know it. A lot of the different pieces that affect this, a lot of things that go into the decision making. And probably most importantly, in my mind, is the life cycle analysis, because we all do a pretty lousy job of thinking in terms of life cycle for anything. Don't you think? I would agree. Living green or sustainably is about more than saving on your electric bill and doing your part to protect natural resources. It is about a safer and healthier life for you and your family without sacrificing style, quality, or budget. This is a movement to provide all of us with clean air to breathe and water to drink, safe, healthy food to eat, and places to live, and energy to run the places where we live, learn, work, and play. Join your hosts, Marla Esser Close, the Green Home Coach, and Tony Pratt of The Sound Room to learn how everyday green homes work for you, your family, and your community. Well, hey, y'all, it's Marla, the Green Home Coach, today in virtual studio, which is our home place now, (laughs) with Tony, my green guy (laughs) co-host. Yeah, it's rare we're in studio. No, I miss it. It's no longer the days where we did more recording there. I miss it, but this is just as good. So 500 miles apart, and we're not, you know, out there having to drive or fly or walk or pedal to do this. So that's good. Well, you know, what's amazing is we have uh, adjusted our behavior, which you know, obviously benefits the environment. We have less carbon impact mm-hmm. doing these shows. And if we can't figure it out, why can't our betters, our political leaders, <laughs> and all the advocates figure that part out? Okay, so I get, I live in a very conservative state, right? I'm in Oklahoma. And I get a political we have a, um, a special election here because our senior senator announced he was leaving office. So they're having a special election for his replacement senator. And so we get a flyer for one of the candidates. And this person has previously run on a very conservative platform. Great. You know, that's what the state is about. But here's what got me. We need to restore our energy independence. And I... <laughs> All I could think of when I saw that is Tony. (laughs) Number one, I mean, they're talking about fossil fuels. They're talking about oil and gas. We're an oil and gas state. Let's, you know, call it what it is. But energy is not the fuel. And ironically, this state has huge, and I do mean huge, investment in alternative energy inputs. So it was just kind Mm -hmm. of such a funny it's like, yeah, yeah I, that doesn't really mean what you think it does. <laughs> you know, it, it's funny because I always laugh about that because when it comes to energy, I am a big believer in a full portfolio of everything. While there are some things that, yes, you do want to start to transition out of, it's still got to be part of the process until we have an infrastructure that can handle nothing but alternative. And once again, right. what this whole conversation about today is, even alternative, is it really, truly better than what we have? There are trade-offs for everything. You know, we talk about solar. 
hey, yeah, solar is a great idea. What are the effects on wildlife that nobody talks about? Where are we getting the material to make the panels, which is what nobody is talking about? You know, so do we really know? We probably don't, and, and but we have, we have to be willing to have that honest yes. discussion to where you can't sit there and say my way or the highway, like we've talked about so many times. We all have to get yeah. on the same side of the problem. Well, and even if we're not on the same side of the problem, if we're, you know, you and I are always big advocates of putting the problem in front of us, not between us. Mm-hmm. And I am that way with my husband, and I'm really that's kind of how I really want to live my life. And that opens up so much more dialogue when you have this common thing in front of you. And we have a lot of big, wicked problems that we are facing. So this is a good way to look at those problems and those challenges and these things that we need to overcome. So. What I think applies here, like everything else we talk about, is that we all need to be willing to listen. Mm -hmm. We need to be willing to hear something that's uncomfortable for us. And we need to be open and open to new ideas and open to looking at things. And we're going to screw up some along the way. There's just no two ways about it. We're human beings. But, and I don't like using that word yet, (laughs) we have this capability to, things will start changing. I mean, things have already started changing and it's specifically in the viewpoint of electric vehicles and internal combustion engines. There's a lot of good conversation going and there's a lot happening that's being driven by consumer demand, by wow power, by all kinds of Mm -hmm. things. And there's a lot of advantages of electric vehicles that are kind of the, what I call the obvious benefits. You know, it doesn't, you don't have to go stand in line or sit. What do you do? drive in line, <laughs> sit in your vehicle in line at a gas station. And we don't have to, you know, transportation of gasoline. We have much less maintenance on an electric vehicle because there's just not as many moving parts. And then on the flip side, okay, well, all those mechanics that we're working on those cars are now going to be finding new ways to use their skills. Okay. That happens in a lot of industries. What we're currently using for fueling stations may have to diversify which they kind of already did with convenience stores, right? There's all these other things that that happen. So here, even in Oklahoma City, the number of electric vehicles we're seeing on the road is increasing almost daily. It's like I can almost watch it. And there's been so many more coming on the road, just even in the last year. And I don't know if there's been a singular event that has driven that, or I'm more attuned to seeing them, or is that another answer? You know, part of it is... Let's face facts. Internal combustion engines are not going away anytime soon. So while some of these gas stations, you know, nothing can change overnight. No, I mean they're still going to be needed. A catastrophe or something like that. Yeah, we deal with it, but anything in a normal market sense is not going to change overnight. Plus, before we could change over every car to be an EV, the infrastructure's got to be there, and it's not just like every one of these cars can be charged at home. I can't charge a car at my house. My electrical system's from the 40s. There is no way. I would need serious upgrades at home before I could even think about it. And knowing that I can drive anywhere from two to 300 miles just for work, not even getting home, you know, the batteries better be a lot better than what they are just for me to be able to drive a single day. Well, that's why we were looking at a plug-in hybrid. That was exactly why, because I could drive in the city on electric, because my Mm -hmm. trips are short and Oklahoma City is a good enough size that I could pretty much get anywhere I needed to go in a daily charge. And then we'd have the gas engine, the internal combustion engine to be there for longer trips, as you know, know, back to St. Louis and up to see our family. Because we know we're going to be on the road a lot for the next few years if we want to have any time with the kids and grandkids. So this hybrid approach though, is that ended up not being the solution we could do. Supply chain came into that. (laughs) But this idea of thinking it's not just one answer, or it may be a combination, Mm -hmm. or it may be a hybrid approach. I think that helps for us to have more options that kind of ease us into things. Does that make sense? Well, well, that's exactly the way we should be doing it. There's got to be multiple paths to get to the same spot. You know, me, I've got a hybrid. I love my hybrid. It's not a plug-in hybrid, though. No. It's, you know, it's a Honda. It's a gas hybrid. However, with how I drive, it gets great gas mileage. It gets a lot better gas mileage than my company car. Which and is you're, just stretching that, you're stretching your gasoline. 
yeah. as much as you can. So if you can't change over to using something that you feel is a better option for you, being able to make the most of what you can mm-hmm. get to is it's kind of like, you know, if you're running out yeah, of this, groceries, you stretch that can of beans as far as you can. Right. This, <laughs> this is the next idea. this is the next best option for me. Right. And that's always I mean, that was one of the first things we were taught when I went into sales training a billion years ago is BATNA, best alternative to a negotiated agreement. Mm-hmm. Plan B. And C. I would agree with that. And that's always been a way I think I've tried, and I know a lot of people have tried to look at everything they do and say, okay, if this one doesn't work, what is our next best thing? Isn't it always the best option for your belief, but also for your budget? It's what you can afford to do. I'm really being careful with this whole thing about afford and budgets, because the more and more studying I do, the more I'm learning about how people, we use money to justify our decisions more than we use it to make our decisions. Does that make sense? I disagree. I I agree. This podcast is not about that. So we're going to have to come back to that one. (laughs) And we'll bring on the psychologist or sociologist or whatever the right ist is. But I do agree that we do make the best decision in our budget for whatever reasons we do it. So I will agree with you on that completely. And in that being, having that grid to compare, okay, here are my options and what are the trade-offs and which ones do fit in my spending allotment helps a great deal. And part of that conversation is not just about the money attributes, it's the other things we're spending to make a decision. So specifically about a vehicle to drive, we're thinking about how much it costs to buy the thing itself. We're talking about how much it costs to operate and maintain and repair it, right? Fuel right. cost, oil changes, maintenance, tires, whatever. So that may be different for different vehicles. And interestingly enough, much of the same thought process that we've used for telling people to buy better homes, green homes, high performance homes. It's that, yeah, it may cost a little bit up front, but you're going to have less maintenance. You're going to have less upkeep. It's going to be more durable. It's going to last you longer. It's going to cost less to operate. Ironically enough, a lot of those things apply to better made cars, however they get their power. (laughs) Yes, I would agree. So Then it comes down, and this was the point that kind of got us started, is what else are we using to create these? So in the case of electric vehicles, anything electric, by the way, not just electric vehicles, and since we are electrifying so much of our society, this is important to remember, batteries in particular, which is how we do this, require a lot of rare earth minerals. Mm -hmm. This has gotten into, if we're looking at sustainability through all of the lenses, societal, economic, just so you know justice um how well we're treating people by the you know societal standards etc workforce fairness all this rare earth minerals do not necessarily fall on the better side of a lot of those that's a great point because i would tell anybody if you are embracing electric vehicles solar power electrifying everything just get rid of fossil fuels you better do a couple things you better embrace mining because that's the only way you can get it. And that has a huge environmental impact. Okay, I'm going to put a caveat there when you get finished. Not, not a problem. And you better embrace that you are going to be dealing with countries that do not have the same beliefs when it comes to human rights that we do here. So first of all, because we as consumers, and I'm going to intentionally use that word consumers as much mm-hmm. as I hate it. We as consumers are at least one level, if not six levels removed from knowing that that battery was mined and made yep. in probably China, that many of the rare earth minerals come from third world or developing nations or countries with a lot of conflict. I always mm-hmm. think of conflict diamonds, but I mean, kind, of, diamonds, the same, yep. kind of in the same genre, same thing. right? Same thing. And it is one of the major smartphone companies got into a big kind of public conversation about their batteries and why much of their manufacture was done in China, because that's where the source of the materials were that were needed for the smartphone. And we, in our haste to convenience, I'm just as guilty as anybody else. Sometimes I try to be very intentional about my decisions, but we all fall into this once in a while. So I'm not placing blame here. And I'm not saying I'm blameless because I have a smartphone. (laughs) I drive a car. (laughs) 
<laughs> and it has a battery in it and it has a hybrid battery in it. So there's, I don't know, it's not the same completely as an electric vehicle battery, but you know, there's shades of this, right? So acknowledging that we have this information has been becoming increasingly important, this transparency, this origin for our food, for our minerals, that for our materials, for all of this. And this whole thing really comes into something called the life cycle analysis that goes beyond that for where sources, but we as consumers don't get all that information. We don't understand where all the materials came from or how they were mined or made or harvested. And that has been a big push, interestingly enough, of a lot of sustainability reporting is to get that chain of custody and that transparency out there. And in the electric vehicles, because they have such big batteries, it's a bigger question and a bigger thing to ponder. Because well, your smartphone battery is like minute compared to an electric vehicle battery. And I wonder if this whole pulling back the curtain, so to speak, and understanding the transparency of the whole process is because of the whole ESG movement. I think a lot and of the it ESG is. reporting. Yeah, I think because a lot of it is. as these companies are having to sit there and say, you know, where are you on the whole social justice platform? And all of a sudden, it's like, oh, yeah, by the way, uh, our biggest material source is mining nickel in the rainforest of the Amazon, paying people, you know, 50 cents. I don't think it was Amazon, but anyway, it was a rainforest somewhere. Yeah, whatever, you know. (laughs) But I'm just saying, that's a lot of people just don't realize it. And I think when you start factoring that in, that really does change the calculus. Well, I'm like, you know, I made a decision that I wasn't real comfortable choosing natural stone in any of the projects. I was for myself particularly because there's some stone that's mined in questionable ways. And I just prefer to keep out of that because I don't know how to do enough research to know that I'm getting equitable mined, fair labor mined and all that. We have the same thing in the clothing industry. We have a lot of, you know, fast clothing industries that have been reliant on child labor or very inexpensively paid labor. And more and more people are starting to ask the questions. And here's where it gets hard is how do we ask ourselves our questions and how do we align those with our values? And we talk a lot about values on here. So I would say if your values include any of the, (laughs) you know, knowing what your trade-offs are, You've got to look at all that. Where do the materials come from? Are they supporting the kinds of companies that you feel good knowing you're supporting, you're buying from, voting with your pocketbook? And it's not to say that electric vehicles are a bad thing because I think they're doing a lot of good Mm -hmm. and I think there's a lot of possibility. And I think getting on the leading edge of this with a lot more electric vehicles on the ground is pushing some of the other things that need to be catch up, especially infrastructure with charging stations, and doing this as responsibly as we can. Want to find and sell the value of green homes and features in your clients' projects and homes? I'm Marla Close, the Green Home Coach, and I have built What Makes a Green Home Green audio program just for you. This program offers an easy-to-understand language audio trainings that are easy to consume on the go with resource guides to help you absorb the information and reference it easily in your day-to-day activity. Your investment in this green home knowledge could unlock thousands of dollars more in business for your home projects. Check out what makes a green home green and how it will help you find and sell the value of green homes and features in your clients' projects and homes. Greenhomecoach.com backslash home pro. Now that we're back, we talked about a caveat a few minutes ago. And we were talking about mining materials, you remember? So we think linear. We think mine materials, use materials, material end of life, throw it away. And maybe with some of these, particularly like rare earth minerals, maybe we will get smart enough that we realize we can't think linearly with these especially with the human potential effects that are in potentially in place for these, potentially with the detrimental effects to the rest of our natural world, particularly understanding that our natural resources are so very limited. Why aren't we recycling? Why aren't we reusing? I mean, electrics, are, and this gets beyond electronics recycling. And there's actually a company here 
of all crazy places in Oklahoma City that is doing some of that. <laughs> They're, they recondition and recycle. And I promise this wasn't a plug for them, but it just played in so beautifully because it was one of the very first companies I found when I moved to Oklahoma City. I was so surprised. I was like, this is awesome that this company even exists and it's right here so I can learn about it. Um, but they recondition, repurpose, and recycle electric vehicle batteries. Well, you knew somebody was going to have to do it because well, yeah. with all the hybrids that came out in the start of the EVs, those batteries can't just go in a landfill. No. They're hazardous material. Yeah. They're, once again, made by rare earth. So there's not a whole lot of it. And most of it's coming from China. So you have the impact with transportation costs and everything. So it made sense that somebody was going to do it. I mean, we talk about this all the time. You know, when it comes to electronics, people pay to dispose of that so it can go to a real company so they can dispose of things properly so they can harvest it or whatever they can recycle, but it costs money. Now, if you trade in or your EV no longer is going to work and it can't be, you know, oh, refurbished, it can't be repaired, whatever, it's totaled in an accident. Those insurance companies have to pay companies like that to dispose of the hazardous material. It's just like taking your car to get an oil change. You pay a fee to have the oil recycled and disposed of. Same thing with tires. You can't just throw them in a landfill anymore. And we need to think that way with all of our materials that we don't. We Somebody needs to be accountable for the disposal or the reuse when the life of that particular thing is done. And we see this, I think what's gotten so big on the electric vehicle side of it is that it's big. I mean, it's not like you can drop a car into the gutter and it disappears. It just doesn't work that way. No, but there are ways of making them disappear. <laughs> well, yeah, and some of them aren't so healthy either. And yeah, a lot of none of them are healthy. <laughs> I know there's not a huge amount of electric vehicles on the road compared to what there will be in another five or 10 years. So figuring this out sooner than later is in our best interest. And it's stunningly difficult to figure this out because, and I think it's hard for us as consumers to think about it because we don't. And unfortunately, our marketing machines have helped to hide that, I think, even deeper. But it's worth asking the questions. And it's not saying don't do it. It's just saying know what you're doing and have a plan and make sure you're doing it for reasons that make sense to you. Because if when you study the life cycle analysis of what it takes to make the battery that goes in your electric car, that may or may not affect your decision. But maybe knowing that you have a place where that can be reconditioned or reused or there's a life afterwards that may help you make that decision. I think a lot of people are making decisions based on where they live, too, because of the charging infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Well, and let's be honest here. It's very important to have a way to recycle this material because we're going to need it to be able to build newer batteries in the future. We are running into a serious supply chain issue. (laughs) You think it's bad getting a new car now, knowing we can't get circuit boards and all that, the chip shortage and everything? We think it's going to happen in eight to 13 years where manufacturers only are making EVs and there's not enough copper for all the electrical connections. And there's no internal combustion engine cars being made anymore because that has been the commitment from a lot of these dealers. But I'm going to tell you my personal experience is a little bit different than that because when we went to go look for a replacement vehicle, it Crazy enough, it was so hard to find a used vehicle as well because there was such Mm -hmm. a supply, I mean, such a demand for limited supply. It ended up, just by sheer luck, we ended up finding a new vehicle that had been, everything we found had been, you know, a deposit was on it. It was committed to a customer, and we found one that had just been canceled. I mean, luck of the draw. Otherwise, we wouldn't have gotten it. But it was less to buy a new car than it was to buy a used one. (laughs) That's I've because never right had now, that happen. if you order a new car and you can wait, you get it at your price. Right. However, if you need a car now, your right. only recourse is a used car, which means small supply and a large demand. And the same thing happening with houses. That's, that's exactly, exactly the same thing. it. 
that it's the same exactly thing happening. It. Sorry, you guys, yep. you knew we couldn't get through our podcast without talking about homes a little bit. <laughs> I mean, it is called the Everyday Green Home Podcast. But that is exactly right. So this whole idea of trade-offs, I mean, you guys know how we are about wicked problems, no matter what we call them. There's not a simple answer. There's probably multiple answers with varying degrees of comfort or discomfort. Everything's going to be a trade-off. And then if electric vehicle works in your life, power to you. Just do it as smart as you can. I want one too. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, but I also want to be able to fuel mine with my own solar panels. And I can't do that yet. So I don't want to, mm-hmm. although we actually have a very high renewable energy percentage of, of juice in our grid here in Oklahoma. Um, that's been one really great side effect of me moving here. <laughs> I didn't expect that. Right. Um, but you still have some that is powered by fossil fuels just because that's okay. how it is. Oh, yeah. Better Everybody mix, has. Better mix in Missouri. And I'm happy to do that. And that was yep. a happy X or just happy byproduct of moving here. And we actually have a decent charging infrastructure for electric vehicles here, which is probably why we're seeing so many of them on the road, because we've invested some money in a charging infrastructure, which, okay, so talk about kind of different worlds. I mean, who would expect Oklahoma oil and gas leader to have this great charging infrastructure? It's kind of interesting. There's different powers at work on all sides of this equation, and everybody is looking for solutions. And as long as we're looking for solutions that better more people than less, I think it's worth pursuing. Now, if we're just pursuing solutions for the sake of a few people getting a heck of a lot of money and nothing else, I don't know that that's what I really want to support. No. (laughs) I know it's not. So, As a society, we need to be approaching an all access kind of a portfolio where it's all inclusive. We understand we need all these different types of energy. Coexist. These types of, yeah. Because here's one thing to get to from point A to point B, point A being fossil fuel based, point B being alternative energy based, you're going to have to marry the two together and just your percentages will change over time. Well, it's kind of like, phasing out and yeah this is how i think about phasing out like an old version of software you know you continue supporting it you tell everybody you're going to sunset it and then years down the road you sunset it but you give everybody adequate warning you give them other paths you give them an exit for an entrance to the next phase you have to build the infrastructure whether it's charging stations whether it's making sure the grid can handle two to three new electrical cars per home being charged at night, during the day, during the weekend, whatever. All of this stuff has to be factored in, which I'm pretty sure nobody has really thought about. Oh, I've seen some amazing propositions for how we can use cars and homes to complementarily charge each other and um, basically using your vehicle as a storage for your home. It's more than I can express right at this moment because I'd have to go back and really read it. But there's There's definitely some ideas out there. And I think some of those ideas are going to, you know, end up playing out. And we're just going to have to keep trying a lot of different ideas and a lot of different ways of doing it. The only roadblock, though, and you and I both understand this because of our background in construction, is the municipal codes. Those ideas have to work into the codes. And if if the inspectors um, won't agree with it, they won't be done. Yeah, I just saw something in um, something I was looking for some reference to the charging stations and homes, but we can, I mean, there's people here already putting charging stations in, obviously, I mean, across the country. So they've figured out part of it. Well, most of them are in existing homes already. Mm -hmm. You know, now some municipalities are starting to codify. Yeah. And I know when we looked at the plug-in hybrid, it came with a standard, what, 120 volt charger that you could plug into a household Mm -hmm. plug, but it was a slow charge. It was a trickle like it would take overnight to charge. Yep. And if you wanted a fast charger, that was where you had to upgrade to the 240 and put in a special charger with a special mm-hmm. circuit. But it's, you know, the people are starting to figure it out. So that is good. I think this whole materials issue, that's going to be a biggie because it already is a biggie because we need a lot of material. We're depending on batteries for so much more and we've got to find some some ways to stretch out what we know works until we find some other options for storing power. Yeah, there was a uh, an interesting article I had read 
that they were talking about if you were trying to increase like to another 50 megawatts of, you know, alternative energy as far as electrified, you know, solar, whatever, you had to mine another 20 million pounds of ore to get the metal you needed. Well, I have said for years that we will end up I'm sorry, up 20 mining. million tons. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. I mean, I look at how much composite material goes into these wind turbines when they're hauling them down the highways to install them out in West Oklahoma, and it's a lot of material. And there's a lot of material that goes into factories or power plants mm-hmm. or everything else. So there's, I mean, just because you see one and not the other doesn't mean there's not a lot of material in both. Mm-hmm. But, and this was not where I intended for this conversation to go, but it makes a lot of sense that it is. We got to figure out how to reuse the materials that we've already pulled out of the earth. Yep. We've got to. It takes too much energy to do all this with virgin materials. It's we're, you know, we always have this not in my backyard, so nobody wants the mine to be close to them. Yet we got to pull the minerals from somewhere. And if they're already mined, then why not use those things? That would protect a lot of different aspects and give us minerals. And I don't know how we're going to figure out that we need to do more of that, but that Seems like one logical conclusion to me. Well, it's got to be top of mind because otherwise you're destroying some kind of an ecosystem just to get what you need. Now, while here in our own country, we see it all the time, mining developments being struck down, planned mining, you know, not passing regulations. Uh, Some judge says, nope, you can't do it because somebody's protesting it. However, it sure seems like we're very much accustomed and okay with, oh, you know what? We don't want mining here, but I'm fine with it over in the Philippines. Fine with it over in Indonesia. I'm fine with it over in Central Africa. You know, Mm -hmm. and that mentality, I think, has got to change. It's got to be shared sacrifice. Yeah, Um, the global mentality. I agree. It's a global mentality, but it's also still, uh, is it a remnant of the whole colonialist (laughs) <laughs> mentality of maybe you take advantage of lands overseas to supply the riches of yeah. the homeland. Oh, we could get in some deep politics discussions oh, on yes, all that can. because there's oh, been yes, a lot of protection of assets that if we didn't need those assets probably would change political outcomes a great deal. And that's not just history. That's now. I mean, anybody that's paying attention is seeing it. You know, we, I don't know that we'll ever be truly independent of anything or any other countries because we are now globally so connected, even with the supply chain cutoffs and shipping cutoffs and port backs up and all the craziness that's happened the last few years. How fast can we ramp up to fill that void? You know, that's part of the reason there's a backup is because we've either got to wait on it to come from someplace else, or we're going to wait on it to develop closer to home. And there's all a time component to it. And with everything that was going on with Ukraine, there were a lot of experts that were saying, well, this could lead to a shift away from interconnected globalism just because people are seeing the effects of, well, what happens when global connected countries decide to go to war? This is the first time we've really seen something like this happen with the true globally connected economy. And it's been a big effect. Yes, it has. And, and we still don't Eurasia, know. Eurasia, I mean, the whole area of Europe and Asia, even higher interdependencies there because so many countries are so small, they can't do it all. Right. And I think a little bit different feeling from what we have in the United States. And Yeah. I just don't think we'll see the full effects for another five years no, to really gauge how bad this was. That's very possible. So in the meanwhile, back to electric vehicles <laughs> to bring this one home. <laughs> This whole idea of wicked problems is here not to frustrate you, oh, you mighty listener, and not to say, no, don't do these things. It is to get you to think, get us to think. I mean, we're only scratching the surface here. That's all we can do in 30 or 45 minutes is scratch the surface and give you some resources to go check out. But we think having these conversations are important. And if there is anything that we have learned is that talking through things and putting, as we say, the problems in front of us together makes a heck of a lot of difference. And Mm -hmm. we hope that by you getting into this conversation with us, that you will be able to do some of the same thing and bring your beautiful energy and thoughts to helping to solve some of these really great, big, gnarly, wicked problems we have. So transportation's a biggie. 
And vehicles are only one part of transportation. We know that there's a lot of parts to transportation, but um, yeah. we both live in car centric cities. So cars are still a pretty important part of our lives. Yes, they are. And, you know, one thing we have to always remember when we're discussing these wicked problems, the wicked problem can only be improved. It can never really be solved. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, every one of those improvements are likely to create new and novel problems. We live in a big, complicated world, folks, and there comes a lot of gnarly problems with it and a lot of awesome opportunities to improve the situation for a whole bunch of people. And I think we're going to continue to choose to look at it as opportunities to overcome challenges as much as we possibly can. No, we have to. Hey, it's the only way we can continue to hope to hope. So there you go. So we hope you had some part of your brain scratched a little bit today with our wicked gnarly problem discussion. And I'd be real curious, you know, what are you thinking about for your next car? And what are some of the factors influencing your decision? There's a lot to think about. Tony, you got any great words of wisdom to wrap us up? Uh, you know, when it comes to cars, I'll be very honest. I am not one that needs the latest and greatest. I have a 2012 that is totally paid off. It's my little hybrid. I rarely drive it because I have a company car. I probably won't be buying a new car for another 10 years. So um, I'm all about the continue to use it as long as you can. Hey, there's a lot to be said for that. And uh, I think we're all looking for solutions to coexist. And we're going to have people on the leading edge and people that are bringing up the rear and everything in between and literally in transportation. That is. Yeah. But we need all of those pieces of the puzzle to come together to work together. So, you know, just a little bit to think twice. And we will continue conversations about wicked problems next go round. Yeah, because unfortunately, they're not going away. No, nah, they'll still be here. So stay tuned. We'll catch you next episode of Wicked Problems on the Everyday Green Home Podcast. We welcome your feedback. And uh, with that, have a great, great day. That wraps this episode of the Everyday Green Home Podcast. Get the show notes with all the resources mentioned in this episode. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast app so you never miss an episode. Want more? Join the Love Your Everyday Green Home private Facebook group for more resources and behind-the-scenes insights. And remember that living a little better and greener is easier than you think.